Good morning to all of you who are listening to this talk at 7 o'clock in the morning, Central Time, and to all of you who are listening to this talk at 7 p.m., again, Central Time. I'm pleased today to talk about research that we've been engaged in that combines software testing and machine learning, and in particular, deep neural networks. This work is in collaboration with my colleague, Matt Dwyer, and our PhD student, Srupa Dola, who you can see pictures of on the slide. As we all know, machine learning is continually being used in important applications, and in some cases, critical applications. Because of this, it's imperative that we have confidence in the answers produced by machine learning components. Testing techniques for machine learning have recently become a very active area of research. In today's talk, I will discuss some of the testing techniques for DNNs that have been developed, as well as present an issue with the current testing techniques, which is the focus of our research. So let's start with talking about the testing of traditional software. Research on testing for programmed or traditional software has been ongoing for over 60 years. Software testing is essentially an exploration or an investigation of a software product, and it's conducted to provide stakeholders with information about the quality of the software under test. That it, it is used to provide confidence that the software meets the specified requirements. Over the 60 years of active research, a broad range of approaches have been proposed. Today, the software industry relies on testing as the primary way to provide information about the quality of the software product. Now, software testing is expensive and in fact accounts for 80% of the development time, but it is essential in order to provide confidence in a software product. Many different techniques have been developed, and a commonly used approach uses code coverage during testing. Now, from the beginning of testing until now, various types of code coverage metrics have been developed. Code coverage metrics do two things. They guide the generation of test cases, and they are used to evaluate the completeness of a test suite. These coverage metrics include statement, branch, diffuse pairs, and MCDC, which is Modified Condition Decision Coverage, which was developed by NASA and is still used heavily by them. The general principle is that the higher coverage increases users' confidence in the correctness of the software. So these techniques try to increase coverage by running test inputs. As I said in the beginning, we are experiencing a wide-scale deployment of deep neural networks, or DNNs. They are being used to standalone applications and components in critical applications, including health and self-driving cars, as well as in making important decisions about who gets paroled and the construction of maps, for example. The reliability of DNNs is important, and there's a need for rigorous testing. And thankfully, the testing of DNNs have become an extremely active area of current research. So what are DNNs? They are a class of machine learning models that can extract high-level features from raw input. Similar to the human brain, DNNs contain a large number of interconnected elements called neurons. These DNNs have multiple layers of neuron and each layer contains a number of neurons. A typical DNN consists of an input layer, one or more hidden layers, followed by an output layer. 
Neurons are connected by edges that have weights, which correspond to the model parameters, which are used in order to make predictions. So here's an example of a DNN. The neurons are indicated by circles and are connected by edges to neurons in the next layer. There's an input layer that receives the raw data, and then we have a number of uh, hidden layers which continually transform the input from low-level features into high-level features. And finally, the output layer is the prediction layer. And so the output layer will predict the result. Now let's consider a neuron which has a, a, a great impact on testing. A neuron receives its input as a weighted sum of outputs of neurons from the previous layer, as was shown in the diagram. The neuron then applies a nonlinear activation function on this input to generate its output, which is sent to another neuron in the other layer. The model learns its parameters by training on known input data called the training data. The objective of DNN training is to learn the model parameters in order to make accurate predictions on unseen data during deployment. The assumption, and it's a very large important assumption, is that the input data will have the same distribution as the training data. In other words, that it has the same characteristics as the training data. So how do we test these DNNs? The learned DNN is much different from the traditional program software uh, in a number of ways. They do not have well-defined specifications, but instead rely on examples that represent the intended behavior. The examples are used to train the parameters, which results in a model where this behavior is encoded as values of the learned parameters. Also, the training process continues until the learned function is an accurate approximation of the intended behavior. And finally, the accuracy of the learned function is expected to generalize to a set of inputs composed of the data distribution on which the training examples are represented. In other words, the input data is expected to have similar representation as the training data. Now, so the question is, can the 60 years worth of experience in testing be used to test DNNs? The characteristics that we talked about present challenges for applying existing software techniques. Now, the first paper on testing DNN was published in 2017. And in 2019, there were a total number of 144 papers, which indicates the um, importance that DNN testing now has. While structural code coverage metrics are ineffective for DNNs, methods that cover combinations of computed DNA neuron values have been developed, and these are developed and used to assess and drive DNN testing. So just like in traditional testing, we use the structure of the code, here we're using the structure of the DNN model and in fact the neuron. As I said, the DNN model generalizes to the set of inputs that have the same distribution as the training data. This DNN generalization is a challenge to testing, and in particular, how do current DNN testing techniques treat valid and invalid inputs? In traditional software testing, input validation logic is distinct from functional logic. And again, the principle is that test suites 
that achieve higher coverage are better and that they exercise more of the validation function and the error code. So here's a diagram that has both program code and a DNN. As you can see, the first part of the program code checks for valid inputs. If the input is valid, the functional part of the code is executed. However, if the input is invalid, then the functional part is not executed and we return a, an error. However, for the DNN, there's no separation for valid and invalid input. And in the computation, a common set of neurons is executed for both valid and invalid inputs. So both valid and invalid inputs exercise the neurons. Now, not distinguishing between valid and invalid input is problematic for DNN testing in at least three ways. First, testing techniques that generate invalid inputs increase the cost with little value added for testing the functional logic of, of the neural network. Secondly, whereas in traditional testing, the coverage produced by invalid uh, inputs is confined to the error logic, for DNNs, an analogous separation and coverage is not guaranteed. And third, when a test case fails, developer time is required to triage the failure. With high numbers of invalid test inputs, developers may be forced to look through large numbers of test inputs. So here is a diagram that has uh, inputs, 100 inputs, and it has, it's on the right-hand side, it shows the coverage. And this is NORAN coverage. And so in the first part, in the first row, we have V, which is valid inputs, and the second row we have V hat, which are invalid inputs. And the only difference between the valid and the invalid is one digit. One digit has a, either zero or one uh, as a difference. If you run the testing techniques, you would get a coverage for the valid of 46%. If you run the coverage for invalid inputs, you would get 44%, which is pretty close. And the um, combined coverage would be 46%. There is, though, a difference in the rows after the bar. Again, we have valid and invalid. And if you run coverage for the valid, you get coverage of 69%. If you run the coverage uh, for the V hat or invalid, you get 63%. However, if you combine the two together, you get coverage of 80%, which means that the invalid inputs have contributed significantly to the overall coverage. So, in general, test suites test suites that achieve higher coverage are not necessarily better. Here we have another diagram of invalid tests from two testing techniques that we're, that, uh, we're talking about. And it would be hard for a developer to determine if the inputs were valid or not. And so these were generated by two of the techniques we'll talk about. And it's hard to determine if they're valid or invalid. And in fact, all of these are invalid. So the research problem that we're addressing is, well, do existing test generation techniques produce invalid inputs? And then secondly, what's the effect of these invalid inputs when we're testing? Uh, what's the effect on coverage by not distinguishing between valid and invalid data? And the third question is, can we produce a DNN system that only generates valid test inputs. For the rest of the talk, 
I'm going to be talking about various issues in test generation techniques. I'll first of all talk about metrics for DNN testing, then describe some of the existing techniques that have been developed to generate test inputs for DNNs. I'll talk about a particular kind of uh, DNN, which is an out-of-distribution model, and it's called a variational autoencoder, a VAE, and it is able to determine if an input is out of the distribution. I'll then talk about our technique to generate only valid inputs and give experimental evidence. So DNN techniques have been developed uh, and they've been developed for natural inputs, which is a data set of information that you want to know something about, and adversarial inputs, which are small perturbations on original inputs, which cause the model to make false predictions. Generating adversarial inputs to expose vulnerabilities is a very active area of research, and that's not what we're addressing here. Our focus is on coverage-guided DNN testing techniques. And so we're looking at test coverage and test generation. Research on DNN test generation is largely inspired by traditional software testing techniques. And so it looks at the structure of the software. The same is true for DNN testing. There have been a number of coverage criteria developed for DNNs, but rather than statements, they focus on the coverage that they, or they focus on the structure that they have, which is neuron coverage. One particular metric is neuron coverage, where a number of unique neurons whose output exceeds a specific threshold value, which is experimentally determined to the total number of neurons present in the DNN. So the earliest work used neuron coverage and considered that if a neuron's output exceeds the threshold value, it is covered. Just as the case of traditional software and a range of coverage metrics that were developed for it, there's a range of coverage metrics that have been developed for DNNs. And the uh, the, the, this kind of coverage criteria can be used to determine whether a test case falls in the major functional region or corner case regions of a DNN. Using these particular coverage techniques, the activation traces of all neurons are captured during training and the upper and lower bounds of activations are measured for each of the neurons. The metric is used to make sure that the test inputs fall in major functional region or corner case regions. Just, for, just like for traditional software where a range of coverage metrics were developed and used, the same is true with DNNs. So the type of neuron coverage is uh, K multi-sectional neuron coverage, and that is that you divide the interval between lower and upper bounds into bins and measure the number of bins that are activated by the input. And you want each bin to have a number of inputs that are activated. The neuron boundary coverage is, uh, is measured as a ratio of the number of covered upper and lower corner case regions to the total number of corner case regions. And again, that's trying to make sure that um, corner cases are covered. The strong neuron activation is the ratio of the number of covered upper corner case regions to the total number of upper case regions and that have high numbers in terms of their activation. The same thing is true for lower bound. And then the MCDC is based on the sign and value change of a neuron's activation to capture the changes in the test. Now that we've seen the metrics based on neurons, let's look at some of the test generation techniques.
In a recent survey, test input generation techniques were classified into three groups. And by the way, the reference to this survey I give at the end of the, top of the slides. Um, they classified the DNN testing techniques into domain-specific test inputs, fuzzing and search-based test input generation, and deep concolic, which are symbolic execution-based inputs. And these really correspond to testing techniques that we use for traditional testing. And so what we did in our research is that we explored a test generation technique for each category. And so for the domain-specific input test in a generation, we explore a deep explorer. DL fuzz for the fuzzing and search-based test input generation, and for deep colic uh, is a symbolic execution-based test input. And I'm going to explain briefly each of these so that you get a feeling for what they're doing. In Deep Explorer, you have multiple DNN models trained on the same data, bit, data set. And the output or the results of these models are compared by oracles. And the objective is that you want to optimize neuron coverage and the differences in predictions of these DNN models. Now, maximizing the objective, then we'll generate tests that achieve high neuron coverage while simultaneously achieving erroneous predictions. And it's true with many machine learning techniques, using gradient ascent is used uh, to solve the joint optimization. DLFuzz is another example of a test generation process, and it is based on fuzzing, which we have, uh, which we use in traditional software. And DL fuzzing is an adversarial input test generation technique, which uses neuron coverage similar to Deep Explorer. However, it does not require multiple DNN models. Deep L fuzz keeps mutating the input very little to maximize the neuron coverage and the prediction difference between the original input and the mutated input. And it uses a constraint to keep the newly generated test inputs close to the original inputs. So they're all around the original input. And finally is concolic, deep concolic. It uses the concolic testing approach that we use for traditional software uh, for generating adversarial test inputs for DNA testing. It's a technique that combines symbolic execution and path information from concrete execution, and it supports neuron coverage and the MCDC variants for DNNs. Now, importantly, none of these techniques check whether the test inputs they are generating follow the training distribution. So here's a diagram that shows the current process now, where we get some seed inputs, and then we run it through the test generation technique, and, te and we generate test inputs, with the objective being to increase test coverage and produce inputs that cause the model to make incorrect predictions. Out of distribution input detection is currently a very active area of research in machine learning. These models are sometimes referred to as outlier anomaly detection models. OODs are generative models and they learn the distribution of the data from training and then can predict how likely a test input is with respect to the training data. Now these classifiers have high accuracy on data sampled from the training data, but accuracy on samples outside the training distribution cannot be guaranteed. OODs then can use prediction to identify invalid test inputs. 
They are trained on the same data set as DNNs and use the density predictions to reject inputs with low densities. One particular type of generative model is the variational autoencoder, or VAE, which we use in our work. It uses both valid and invalid data sets and calculates the reconstruction probabilities for both. The VAE and the threshold are then used to predict valid or invalid inputs. We primarily use the VAE in our work. However, we repeated part of our experiments to identify invalid inputs generated by a generative technique called a pixel CNN-based validation approach, which I'll talk about later. A VAE has an encoder, latent space, and a decoder. The encoder is responsible for mapping inputs to a lower dimensional latent space, and the decoder generates new inputs by sampling from the latent space. The latent space is modeled by a code layer and is generated from a prior distribution, uh, a, norm, uh, a normal Gaussian distribution. The encoder's objective is to learn the distribution of the inputs, and the decoder's objective is to learn the likelihood of the original input being reconstructed by the decoder. So here's uh, again a diagram which shows the distribution of handwritten images in latent space. So this is the distribution in the la latent space and it's produced by the encoder. On the right, the images are generated by the decoder from the latent space. And you probably can't see these, but they're they're handwritten digits. All right, so uh, the, I should say, the DNNs, uh, which are these generative models, are trained on both valid and invalid uh, data sets. And the reconstruction probabilities are calculated for inputs for both valid and invalid data sets. The objective, then, is to increase test coverage and produce inputs that cause the model to make incorrect predictions. All right, so here's a, the process that we use and can be used for identifying invalid test inputs. So we have this original, uh, this original display, and the objective then for the test inputs is again to increase test coverage and produce inputs that cause the model to make incorrect predictions. Now then we can use a deep generative model, such as the VAN, to take these inputs and determine whether they're valid or invalid. And so we can determine for the techniques that we explored whether the inputs that they're generating are valid or not. So um, in the next phase of our research, we did experimental studies to evaluate um, the research questions that we were asking, which were, first, do existing test generation techniques produce invalid inputs? Secondly, we know that existing test generation techniques are guided by test coverage criteria. So how do invalid inputs affect these test coverage metrics. Thirdly, the VAE-based input validation can be incorporated into test generation techniques, which I showed. And then how effective is this technique in generating valid inputs, and what's the overhead? And then the fourth question is, can we generalize the technique? Is this determination of an invalid inputs sensitive to the generative model being used. We use the VAE, but what if you use something else? Do you still get invalid inputs? Here is the experimental setup. We're using two data sets, MNIST, 
and SVHN. And we have, for each one of these, three DNN models. Uh, now, the, as it turns out, the results for MNIST and SVHN were pretty similar. And so, in most of the talk, I'm going to be using just the MNIST data set. Um, the input validation of whether an input is valid or not, we use the VAE, and then later on at the end, we had another generative model, which is pixels of CNN. The test generation techniques we used, I've already explained, Deep Explorer, DL Fuzz, Deep Concolic, and we used the coverage metrics that I described. And in the sum of experiments, our baseline was the Deep Explorer. So this table that shows the differences of the DNN models that we use, they range from three layers to 19 layers, from 52 neurons to 28,000 neurons, and from 7,000 parameters to 38 million parameters. So they vary quite a bit. So the first question, do existing test generation techniques produce invalid inputs? And um, Deep Explorer supports three types of input transformations, light, lightning, occlusion, and blackout. And so we generated tests for all three of these NANETs. We randomly selected 500 C inputs for each MNIST and SVHN data set for Deep Explorer and Deep Alphas. Deep Concolic only gets a single input for test generation, and so we gave it a single test. So here is the diagram that shows the existing techniques, the type of inputs they generate, and so what we're doing here is we're taking the existing uh, techniques, generating test inputs, and then feeding those test inputs into a deep generative model. And the one we're using is the VAE, and it's going to determine whether or not the input was valid or invalid. All right, so this is a figure that gives a percentage of invalid test inputs identified by the VAE. Um, in the first three bars, each set represents the constraints of Deep Explorer, light, occlusion, and blackout. The next two bars are DL fuzz and Deep Concolic. Now, you can see that the percentage of invalid tests generated by Deep Explorer varies by the constraint. For all four MS uh, classifiers, occlusion constraint, which is the second bar, produced high percentage of invalid test inputs. In fact, they were greater than 90%, while blackout generated less than 1% invalid inputs. The lighting constraint, which is the first bar, generated 94 and 63% invalid inputs for the models. Uh, DL fuzz generated invalid inputs in the range of 36 to 46 for three of the DNNs and less than 1% for the largest DNN. And all inputs generated for deep concolic were all invalid for both MNIST and SVHN. So just by looking at this, you can see that there are lots of invalid inputs that are generated by these techniques. And the SVHN classifiers or DNNs are similar. So the results then, do existing test generation techniques produce invalid inputs? And the answer is yes. All three testing techniques studied produced significant number of invalid tests. In fact, it was 42% of the tests on average were invalid, uh, and they ranged from 73% to 100% in the worst case. 
So the second question is that we know that existing test generation techniques are guided by test coverage. So how do these invalid inputs affect the coverage metrics? And again, here we have a diagram uh, where we have the original testing technique, which I have here, deep explore DL fuzz and deep concolic. It generates inputs. We feed it through the, uh, again, the generative model, which we use as VAE. And then it decides whether they're valid and invalid and gives the coverage for valid and invalid. So we want to know how does the invalid affect the overall coverage. And here is a table that gives that information. Uh, if you consider Deep Explore, which is the first line, the coverage for the valid inputs was about 38%, but for the invalid inputs, it was 55%. And this is for neuron coverage, with the total coverage being 55%. So you can see that the invalid inputs uh, really significantly improve the coverage of, of the valid inputs. And the rest of the table is similar uh, where we have the valid producing less than the invalid. Uh, you can also see that deep fuzz, the same thing is, is true. Um, uh, and for concolic testing, none of the inputs that it generated were uh, valid. They were all invalid. So here are the coverage re results for the multi-sectional uh, metrics. The results are similar to what we saw in neuron coverage. In the first row, valid inputs contributed 11% of coverage, while invalid inputs covered 58%, with the total coverage of 58%. So as you can see, invalid inputs contributed significantly to the overall coverage. So the results for this second research question is, do existing test generation techniques, which are guided by test coverage criteria, how do these invalid inputs affect the metrics? And the answer which we showed is that the invalid inputs yield high coverage for a variety of coverage criteria when compared to valid inputs. And these invalid inputs frequently increase the coverage beyond which that would have been achieved with the valid inputs alone. So the next question relates to incorporating a VAE into the test generation technique itself and its effectiveness and overhead. So now the difference is that we're not using the VAE just to check whether the input that's generated is valid or invalid, but what our technique does is actually embeds it, the VAE, into the test generation process. And so the only inputs that are produced should be valid. Now, we, what we did is to augment the original objectives with the probability density estimated by a generative model and solved joint optimization, which is to increase test coverage and produce inputs that cause the models to make increase incorrect predictions, which was the objective uh, today, and but also followed the distribution of the training data. And maximizing this joint optimization will result in inputs that follow the distribution of the training data along with satisfying the objective of the coverage. And then here is a diagram then of our approach, and you can see that we have increased we have embedded a deep generative model into our test generating process. So we have a DNN under test, 
and it uses the objectives that it had and uses gradient descent to uh, generate some test data. But then we have the deep generative model, and we, which produces probability density, and then we take both of those objectives and do a joint optimization. So we augment the objective with the prob probability density estimated by a generative model, and again, using gradient descent. Right, and so uh, the figure shows the neuron coverage of valid inputs over a range of 200 seed inputs for both the baseline Deep Explore, which doesn't have the VAE embedded, and the Deep Explore plus VAE. And in the first graph, you can see that the Deep Explorer with the VAE uh, generated a number of, a lot of invalid, I mean valid uh, inputs where the baseline did not. In the second diagram, you can see that, again, the uh, Deep Explorer with the VAE generated very quickly valid inputs where the Deep Explorer baseline uh, um, generated three valid inputs and so on. In the last figure, it was this very large DNN with 38 million parameters and it was hard for us to detect the valid and the invalid and so it's coming close. Uh, here we show a comparison of the number of test inputs generated by the baseline and our technique and it shows that our technique improved the baseline performance in terms of the number of tests generated by more than 70 percent across all inputs so these were the valid inputs generated uh, by Deep Explorer and Deep Explorer embedded with the VAE. So um, what it shows that our technique is effective over the baseline, even for scenarios where the baseline is able to achieve test coverage comparable to ours. In terms of the runtime for Deep Explorer and Deep Explorer plus VAE, uh, we again inputted 200 seed inputs, and the Deep Explorer for these inputs took 1.3 hours, and the Deep Explorer plus VAE took one hour. Now that's because the Deep Explorer is generating both valid and invalid, where the Deep Explorer plus VAE is just generating valid. Now the key determinant is the number of iterations which are used by grading and set, and their grading and set is common for both techniques. Deep Explorer plus the VAE improved the effectiveness in generating valid tests, and it improved it from 6.2 minutes for each valid test to 1.5 minutes on average to generate a valid test. So the results then uh, are that incorporating a VAE into the test generating test generation process eliminates the generation of invalid test inputs, significantly increases the generation of valid inputs, reduces the time to generate valid inputs, and increases the coverage achieved on generated valid inputs. So <clears throat> in this next question, what we're addressing is, as I showed you, the generative model of VAE identified a number of invalid, in fact, many invalid inputs. So the question is, um, is the VAE um, accurate? And can, if we use another generative out of distribution model, would it detect invalid inputs or not? Um, and so what we did was to 
uh, take another generative model, which is the Pixel C N++, and uh, it also works with the probability density, and it all outputs the probability density explicitly. And so we train both valid and invalid data sets on the Pixel C N++. And here's the diagram that shows our um, experimental design, where again we have the three test generation techniques. They produce input, test inputs, and then we run it through a deep generative model uh, validator. And in the previous, uh, previous slides, we used VAE, and now we're using a new one the Pixel C N++, and it will also determine whether or not uh, the input is valid or not. And here we show the percentage of invalid test cases which were identified by Pixel C N N. Um, so for the MNIST model, uh, it classified a high percentage of test inputs generated by Deep Explorer light and occlusion constraints as invalid and classi classified all test inputs as valid for the blackout constraint, which is the fourth, third bar. Um, and the pixel, um, and also the pixel CNN plus classified all test inputs generated by DLFuzz as invalid for the MNES models, and more than 60% of the test inputs is invalid for the SVHN models. And as true with the VAE, all inputs generated by deep concolic are identified as invalid by all models. And here, uh, again, we're comparing the um, VAE identification of invalid inputs with the Pixel CNE. And you can see there is a difference, but the Pixel CNN is also identifying large numbers of invalid inputs. So the results uh, follow the same trend as observed by the VAE-based classifier. However, the percentage of test inputs classified as invalid by Pixel CNN++ is less when compared to that of the VAE for Deep Explorer generated, for the Deep Explorer generated tests. For DLFuzz, the Pixel CNN++ approach resulted in more invalid tests when compared to the VAE-based classification. Both the VAE and the Pixel CNN++ plus, plus based techniques classified all test inputs generated deep concolic as invalid. So VAE had done this, and now this uh, Pixel CNN also invalidates all of the um, test inputs. So the answer to the question about um, is our invalid inputs identified by more than the VAE generative model? And the answer is yes. Uh, we showed for both VAE and Pixel CNN, they both identified uh, uh, invalid inputs that were being produced by the current test generation techniques. Uh, there were different numbers because both of these out of distribution detectors used different uh, algorithms or different techniques to identify valid and invalid. Um, so uh, to really generalize this, we would have to try other types of OODs in order to see that, yes, in fact, it is insensitive. So in summary, what we have found 
is that uh, we've identified limitations in existing DNN test generation techniques and that they do generate invalid inputs. And the coverage criteria in their treatment of invalid input data. So that's also limited, and we found that um, the coverage criteria is in fact affected by the invalid inputs uh, to the extent that you think you're getting great coverage, but the great coverage is mainly based on the uh, invalid test inputs. We also developed a technique for incorporating an explicit model of the valid input space of a DNN into the test generation process uh, to address those limitations. And in fact, what our technique does is produce only valid input. And that's because it was the VAE was integrated into the test generation process. And we also showed experimental results that demonstrate the extent of the limitations and the effectiveness of our technique in mitigating them. And we showed that, yes, our technique can generate valid inputs, and it is uh, the overhead is, in fact, better. Finally, we plan to explore how the well-understood concept of defensive programming that's used in traditional programs uh, as sketched here, can be adapted to DNNs. And you all know all about the exception handling work, and that is defensive programming. This figure sketches a possibility which suggested by the findings in, this, in our work, where the role of the input validation is played by the OOD detector. Uh, if we could do such a thing, testing of the deep neural network would be restricted to inputs that are not out of distribution. And with such an architecture, test suites that achieve higher coverage of OOD and N are better, thereby reestablishing the long-held intuition uh, about coverage for traditional software and that means we could say safely then that DNN test suites achieve higher coverage of OOD and N are better. Now there are a number of references uh, for this work. Uh, one of them is a survey and then we talked about the tools. And so this slide gives some of the references for the work. Thank you and I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have.